You know how people recommend Netflix movies to you and then you look at the runtime of the movie and go, ain't nobody got an hour and 43 to spend? And then you proceed to binge watch a series you've already seen five times? Well, I decided to watch a movie that a lot of you guys are recommending. It's this movie called Super Dark Times that I missed when it was in theaters, but you know, through the power of Netflix, I was able to experience it in my own house and it is really jacked up. Uh, I had actually seen it multiple times and I was like, yo, I really dig this story and I was writing uh, like a video for it because I knew not a lot of people are seeing the movie and I was like, you know, people need to see this movie. And then someone hit me with this like fan theory and I was watching a specific scene and I was like, nah, that's, nah. It's a movie that takes place in the 90s and we're following these two friends when of course something super dark happens. And for those of you who haven't seen it, take this video as the recommendation. So I know some people click on explain videos and go, spoilers. How could I have prevented spoilers? So watch the movie, I recommend it, it's dark, but at the same time it's on Netflix. Half of you bum Netflix anyway, so you have it at your disposal, check it out, and then watch this video as we break it down and get into spoilers. So the friend straight up Katan is a dude. Some people had uh, tweeted me and they're like, yo, this movie's boring. Nothing, ha yes, cause you turned it off way too early. If you did see the movie completely, you know that that little accident escalates into something bigger. And by the end of the movie, there's more murders that are turning up in town. And we get this heartbreaking scene between two friends who realize that, well, things aren't gonna be the same anymore since one of them craves murder. Hence, super dark times. But one of the questions that a lot of people have brought up is, why does he become a killer? And I think that there's a couple clues throughout, you know, there's his background story, like we never see his parents, they're never around. They mentioned that he has another brother who's younger than him, but he's supposed to be like this prodigy, so he's getting all the attention. He's got another brother who's joined the Marines and he gets attention for that. And then his best friend snatched the girl of his literal wet dreams. She just looked and whispered, whoops. It's the most erotic moment of my life. So it's not to say that everyone who goes through that is uh, gonna become a killer, but I think that kind of adds to it when you really look into the story and see like the little intricacies, which I know a lot of people were like, yeah, we really like the, the drama teen aspect of it, the coming of age part. So why does it turn into a straight up slasher at the end? Some people were straight up surprised that it goes that route as if like the movie didn't warn you that that was what was gonna happen. I think it elevates the movie. The first time that I saw it, I was like, yo, this is like a twisted coming of age story as we see these kids growing up to become men and how it just drifts apart. They, uh, they lose their innocence. This little accident escalates into something bigger. If you recall, the movie actually starts off with a deer breaking through a school window and it, it, it like bleeds to death. And I've heard people say that they think Josh was torturing animals since that's a precursor that a lot of serial killers tend to have. But what I find most interesting is that the first recurring character we meet is Allison, who is experiencing that. And that's also the person who we end the movie on. Now, the first time that I saw it, I thought that was a neat perspective because it's not like we're ending on a victim. It wasn't just like a random side character, but it was sort of like her story and she was a survivor. There's even a lot of symbolism throughout the movie because uh, Zach is having all these trippy dreams. And there's one in particular that stood out to me where a sword is looming over him. And since I've binge watched Kanye West's uh, power video multiple times, I've kind of seen this symbolism before. I know it as the sword of Dacles, which comes from a Greek parable where a dude named Dacles wanted to be king for a day and the king's like, ah, right, you wanna be king? Boom, gives him all that fabulousness that he wanted, but he put a sword right over the throne that loomed over him but it was only hanging by a single horsehair. The idea being that when you get that power, fame, glory, luxury, there's always going to be a constant danger present, a risk that comes with having that amount of authority. So if this is a coming of age tale about two boys becoming men, entering adulthood where their actions will have consequences, not just to them, but to people outside of them, then I kind of see Allison's character as more than just a side character that it seems like she is at first watch. Josh probably goes to jail at the end. Zach, since, you know, someone else is sitting in his chair, probably got expelled or, you know, is in jail as well. But the point is, is that we're seeing the perspective of someone who's experienced a dark chapter in her life, but she wasn't going to let it define her. She overcomes it by the end. And again, that being my interpretation of it, I, I thought it was cool because it's like many times you see all these side characters in movies, but all these, I don't know, side characters in life, but you realize that the repercussions of, you know, the actions that happen, they're still the main character in their own story. So for that alone, I think it's worth the recommendation because it gives you some meat to talk about within the film, but there was that theory. And again, this is just a theory. And when we talk theory, we talk about like everything that I just mentioned, out the window, but uh, 
I am a guy who loves dabbling in film theories, even if they uh, may not be 100% true, even if they completely change the story of, you know, the story that you just saw. I'm a person who does think that Daniel Kaluuya's character in Sicario was actually in on it the whole time, and that may change the way you view the movie. I think the entirety of Birdman takes place in Keaton's head, that all the characters are him, and that's why it never cuts away. I even think that DiCaprio is the one who's being incepted in Inception by his own crew so he can make that final decision in the end. So this theory, while it may not be true in any way, shape, or form, I think is an interesting perspective that if it intrigues you enough, maybe it gets you to go watch the movie and then we can discuss what I brought up in the first half. But uh, this little theory goes, what if Allison knew what was going on the entire time? The idea is, is that right at the beginning, that Katana incident is what triggers Josh to become bloodthirsty. Well, if she's the first character we're seeing, if this is really her movie, then Allison observing that bleeding deer in the beginning of the movie and not looking away, but being fascinated by it, goes hand in hand with that. When we see her again, she's fascinated by Zack's injured hand and his weakness and in a sense isn't even questioning why he's crying but embracing him. I'm not saying that she saw them do what they did, but, you know, they were kind of yelling out in public so anyone can see them. Plus, uh, earlier on, she mentioned that she knew that they were outside her house. I didn't realize I'd be so close to your house until I saw it. And then I said, oh, that's X house. Maybe I should stop by and scream penis at the top of my lungs. There's a lot of scenes that we see parallel towards the end of the movie. And we also notice that Zach is like super susceptible because this guy's as horny as can be. We see that he's suffering with paranoia, so it's not like he can't be easily manipulated. There are even scenes where Zack's hand magically doesn't have the cast, and the theory would be that those are technically inserts of Allison's hand, showing that she herself is weaving herself into the story. Like, when the second death of John Whitcomb is mentioned, that's when we see her appear. It's my fault, isn't it? You and Josh? I mean, I could tell you two were... He's got a thing for me. When Zack finds the body mutilated, it could have been Allison retrieving it since Josh adamantly says, No, you fucking don't know how I feel, okay? And you're wrong about me, too. And I'm not saying that Josh is innocent in all of this. He's obviously still doing crazy stuff, but the idea is that he's in cahoots with Allison, and that's why she invites him over. Allison. Hey. What's with the beach towel? It's a surprise. <laughs> you're full of surprises, aren't you? Some may question... Why would Allison be so bloodthirsty? And I guess the same answer with this theory would be that the same reason Josh is. So if he gets invited over for his weed, it's really just all a setup for someone who Allison wants to take out. Your guy's awesome. Fuck that, I am the guy. And she knows. She even confirms that... That uh, Zach isn't coming, is he? Uh, no, he can't make it, unfortunately. You notice her reactions when the sword is revealed, and how it seems like she's just waiting on him. All right, my turn. When Zack comes in, some have suggested, because of the theory, that the reason she's still alive and not, you know, mutilated like he did the other girl is because it's part of her plan. That while Josh is able to swiftly pierce anyone so easily with his katana, he only leaves three marks on her neck because he has no intention of killing her. But he doesn't want her to come off as an accomplice. So she's aware of it all, hence all the time she rubs her neck prior. Now again, this is just a crazy film theory. I still side with what I said in the first half of the movie, but the only time that I was just like, all right, maybe, is that there's a specific scene that happens and if anyone knows anything about A Clockwork Orange, you know that whenever like a psychopath, a coming of age killer is drinking milk, you have to attribute that to Stanley Kubrick. Another scene in A Clockwork Orange is this scene where the guys are raping a woman and one of the most messed up things that they do is that they decide to start. <laughs> The reason why that's so demented is because at that time they knew the song was so popular, they were bound to hear it again, the victims, and thus by singing it, every time they heard the song, this joyful song, all they're gonna think of is that trauma. I had heard other stories in school, I don't know why they told us these in school, about like torture stuff that had happened and where like they do the same thing, they, tor they physically torture them, but they would continuously say, good morning, good morning, good morning. So they'll never greet anyone the same way again. I bring this up because there's a scene in the movie where right before the incident happens in the bedroom that she's like soaking up the sun. And later on, she has another moment where she's soaking up the sun, 
but she's joyful about it, even though it would call her back to that horrendous moment. Now, of course, I see it as that's her overcoming her trauma, but if the theory was correct, then it would show that everything that happened in this movie, all the super dark times, are really a master plan of Alice's. Or it could just be a theory. A film theory. Part one of five. <laughs> Thank you guys for checking out this video. Like I said, crazy theory that I heard for like a, a solid two weeks. I was like, could this possibly be it? Then I saw more interviews with the director and uh, some of the stuff with the writers and they talked about how it's like a pre-Columbine story on how like in the 90s, and again, I'm a 90s kid. In the 90s, the scariest thing after Columbine was a, was a white boy. And uh, I thought it's an, it brings up an intriguing discussion. I like the symbolism in it and I think it's worth a watch. Like I said, it's on Netflix. Other than that, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments section. Uh, and don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. Head on over to Patreon where for just a dollar, we're giving out free katanas.